get started. Thank you all for tuning into conference today for the few people that are on besides the VA. We've got a pretty full room at the VA, so it should be good. We're gonna be talking about a patient who was just at the U in middle of January, then discharged, came back to the VA recently and is now back at the U. So a uh, cross institution case conference uh, with a lot of good stuff uh, in the history. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So we're gonna start at the U, a procedure is gonna be performed. We're gonna to go to the VA and then a diagnosis is going to be made. So let's start at the U. So our UCH course, We've got a 59-year-old man with hypertension, tobacco use, and prior cocaine use. Uh, he's presenting with a blood pressure of 70s over 50s in the field uh, by EMS, and this EKG, which was obtained the second he rolled into the ED. So I'll give you guys about 10 or 15 seconds to take a read at this. This is not supposed to be an extremely complicated EKG. It should be a like uh, you know, type one thinking where you see it and immediately go to something. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm gonna ask one of the interns in the room to give me their very focused read of this EKG. Great, Jake, and why'd you say it was uh, VTAC? Uh, Reagan has Y and then subjacket. Perfect, yeah, so regular, wide, and then even within that, Jake, is this uh, monomorphic or polymorphic? Yeah, great. So this is monomorphic VTAC. And so let's pretend that we're the uh, ED providers. This person rolls in with monomorphic VTAC. What treatments do you guys want to administer right now? Jules. <laughs> great. So we've got Connor Grogan says Jules. What else we have? Yeah, they do have a pulse. They're, they have a pulse and their blood pressure is 70 over 50. Great, so we've got, we got Jules, so we're gonna shock this person. We've got a uh, cath lab as well being activated. Carl, why did you wanna activate the cath lab? Just as like generally in other words, you know it's not like systemic, but it's like a systemic exposure behind. Right. So Carl is saying that this is basically like ischemia until proven otherwise, which is perfect. Great, and then um, any medicines you guys wanna administer? Amio, cool. Connor says he also wants to give this person Amio as well. So you give this guy Amio 300 and 150 in pretty quick succession. All right, so fortunately, uh, the suggestion to shock this man uh, breaks his VT, but the cath lab is still activated uh, and takes this man for uh, coronary catheterization and finds that he has um, sort of minimal non-obstructive CAD. So no STEMI, but minimal non-obstructive CAD. So you're called as the cardiology admitting resident after he comes out of the cath lab. He's now back in normal sinus rhythm, but he had this EKG. Um, and you're going to admit this guy to the CICU for further monitoring. Um, other diagnostic tests you guys want right off the bat. Cool. So his EKG looks like normal sinus rhythm. You get your uh, echo, and I'll just give you his parasternal long. So here's his parasternal long. So take about, this is a running on a loop. So take about, take about 15, 20 seconds for everyone to look at the parasternal long. And then I will ask again, one of the interns who's not Jake to give us their thoughts. No, but you just answered the first question. I'm being very diplomatic. All right, uh, so another intern. Uh, you're looking at a parasternal long axis. What is your focused kind of pocus read if you were standing at the bedside holding this probe? Evan, you've been nominated. After a period of silence, Evan's air has been nominated. What do you got? Um, doesn't like 
Cool. So you, you look at it and you're like, hey, something is off, but I can't quite tell what's off, which I think is a pretty appropriate place to start on this. Uh, any second or third years have additional thoughts? The micro valve to enter the physical feedback loop is that yeah. it takes both the screen and the yeah. uh, Seems like the base may have worse squeeze in the apex. Nice. So base may have worse squeeze in the apex, and then Paul, a uh, future cardiologist, says that the mitral valve should be touching the septum or getting close to the septum, and it's not. Um, and so Paul is sort of like loosely referring to like the EPSS, the endpoint septal separation, um, which is kind of a shorthand way when you look at the echo to see whether the EF is normal. So you guys are all correct. So this EF is 40%. Paul was correct that this mitral valve should be going all the way there, but it's not. And then actually uh, between Evan and Kelly, they also called that there is um, both a basal, uh, basal or abnormality. It's not squeezing as much. And there's sort of a inferior septal abnormality. And so both the septum and the base are not squeezing as much. So from this, the admitting resident thought that this person likely had, and the cardiology, uh, felt likely had a prior MI, but was not having an MI now, and had a new diagnosis of HEFREF. So new diagnosis of HEFREF, person coming in with VT. Um, does anyone in the room uh, want to take a guess? It's sort of a yes or no question. Does this person have VT storm? Does this have one? It's just one VT that we know about. Cool. So we've got some 30 residents shaking their heads saying, no, this person does not have VT storm. <laughs> yeah, so why, so for some of our third years in the room, why does this person not have VT storm? Or what, it, I guess another way to ask that question is, what is the definition for VT storm? It's like a 24 hour period and you Yeah, that's great. So that's uh, Melanie uh, basically just perfectly defined it. So the way to think about it is to first think about a 24 hour period. And then the first branch point is, um, do you have an ICD or do you not have an ICD? So if you don't have an ICD, it's typically defined as basically greater than three events in 24 hours, um, which is a little tough to characterize unless they're in the hospital because you need to have them on telly or you need to be sort of intervening for that but greater than three events in 24 hours or uh, VT that recurs after treatment. So it's sort of an arbitrary definition, but those two things are gonna nebulous, but that's how we say it if they don't have an ICD. With an ICD, it's, about, it's a lot easier to define. And so if you have greater than three, uh, basically like shocks delivered or your pacer or uh, AICD um, gets you out of VT with greater than three times in 24 hours, you meet criteria for VT storm. So basically, if you have an ICD and you get three interventions, you're in VT storm. If you don't have an ICD and you have more than three events in 24 hours, you're in VT storm. So VT storm, a pretty terrifying diagnosis uh, that probably most residents will see at least once in a residency. Um, how do we treat it? So another way to ask that is, what are our actual treatments for VT? So what we'll do here is, because there's some easier ones to remember and some harder ones, we'll start with the interns. Interns, throw out one treatment for VT and we'll kind of go across the room. Say it again. Ablation. Ablation, great. You took the lowest hanging fruit, perfect. All right, a second year. Are there second years in here? Oh, Carl, I love it. Yeah. Great, so Hannah, Hannah from, nice. Hannah's, Hannah's participating remotely, I like it. <laughs> Hannah says Amio. So within the drugs, we've got Amio, awesome. Carl, you're up. Cool, so lidocaine, great. Time for a third year to throw a VT storm treatment out there or a VT therapy. Sedation. Cool, Connor says mexilatine. Sedation does count, we'll get to that in a second, but Connor says mexilatine. Cool. Yeah. So like treating the underlying cause. So this guy has HEFREF. So that's probably where it's coming from. Great. Um, other therapies that we don't commonly use as much or without cards approval, but beta blockers. So like propranolol and uh, metoprolol can be used for this. And then uh, the last one that you should probably only be using if cards is saying it is sodalol as well. But yeah, so not very many therapies for VT. So amio, lidocaine, maxillotine, and then beta blockers and sodalol. So this person comes into the hospital and he gets loaded with amio like you guys had already done in the ED. Uh, and his VT resolves for about 24 hours uh, without any sort of intervention. Any guesses as to what happens after that? 
Yeah, so this guy then goes back into VT. So this guy, uh, about 48 hours into his admission, meets criteria for VT Storm. So at this point, you know, he's, we'll say he's failed AMIO, he's still in VT. What is our next step in his kind of therapeutic path? What do we do next? Nice, yeah, so he gets put on a lidocaine drip briefly, and then Paul was saying we should call EP, which is exactly what happens. So this gentleman, uh, you call EP, and EP says, yep, he meets criteria for a VT ablation. Um, so EP will perform a VT ablation. All right, any questions about the first part of this case? So this is a gentleman presenting with VT. He has that echo showing a decreased EF, which is new. Uh, he has VT on amio, a little bit of a lidocaine drip, and he goes for an ablation. He had never had fuming before and he was not on a beta blocker? No, no, he'd never been on a beta blocker. He had a remote history of cocaine use, which is what they presume the heart failure is from, but he had never had a known MI, as far as anyone can tell. All right, so this gentleman is gonna get a VT ablation. Is anyone in the room budding EP or anything uh, feel comfortable explaining like what a VT ablation entails? With the full disclaimer that I did not know what a VT ablation entailed about till about an hour and a half ago. <laughs> All right. So Connor took a, Connor took a stab at it, which was great. He said that they uh, they use fancy. I'll see if I can get his scientific definition correct. Fancy electrical activity. They burn the shit out of it, and then it's better. That was sort of what he said, which is actually like not incorrect. Uh, it's not the most correct definition, but it's not incorrect. So this is a diagram of the heart, clearly. Um, and let's talk about what a VT ablation actually entails. So for years and decades, going back to the, 19, like the 1990s and early 2000s, they just did these via endocardial ablation. So basically um, what they do is they access the arterial system or the venous system. Um, they essentially thread a catheter in here and there's this kind of like mapping device on the end in which they kind of map out where the VT is in the LV or the RV and they ablate it. That procedure fails, not infrequently. And so starting about, I think about 15, 10, 10 or 15 years ago, they started doing an epicardial component as well. So this is your pericardium right here. The epicardial component, a needle goes in, into the pericardial space, and they also map from the epicardial space. So you map both endocardial and epicardial at the same time to sort of show you exactly where your VT is. So um, this gentleman goes into the cath lab. He gets uh, an endocardial mapping. He gets epicardial mapping. Um, while he's getting epicardial mapping, CT uh, cardiac uh, interventional um, does an angio as well. Again, because what they want to do is they want to make sure the vessels that are going down his heart are not near where that needle is going to hit when they're mapping. Uh, and he gets mapped and he gets his VT ablated. So he has a successful VT ablation and is coming back out of the EP lab to you again. So successful EP ablation, any questions about this procedure or what went on during it? Yeah, good question. So Cassandra asked what his access was. So a good question to clarify in all of our post-procedure patients. Um, so he had uh, left and right uh, common femoral access. Um, both of those were per close, which is a special device that seals the vessel. Yeah, they stopped all his anticoagulation. They also reversed him with protamine as well at the end of the lab. Uh, yeah, good question. So no antiarrhythmics, but they say continue amio. So good questions from our upper level. So those are kind of like the three most important questions. If you haven't admitted a post-procedure patient yet, your time will come. But those are basically the three most important questions when someone's coming out of the lab is where was their access? What did you do? What did you give? And then what should I do now um, in terms of continuing uh, antiarrhythmics? How much fluid did he get? Did they Yeah, good question. He didn't get that much. They used, this is beyond my scope of knowledge, but they used uh, some sort of saline preparation as part of the ablation procedure. Um, but other than that, he did not get much fluid. Okay, so he comes out VT ablation. Um, does anyone know Kind of next step, right? Because clearly this is going to get worse because we still have half the conference to go. Um, <laughs> what complications do we look out for post VT ablation? 
So if Paul is saying pericarditis. So we got perforation, Paul's singing pseudoaneurysm, he says pericarditis, all great thoughts. Any additional thoughts? Nice. So tamponade, so Melanie says tamponade because the needle went through the pericardium and maybe hopefully didn't go into the RV, but always could have gone into the RV or LV. Nice. So like he's still in VT, so like complication in that the procedure wasn't successful. Uh, you guys are... Great, so you guys have like better knowledge of post-VC ablation procedural complications than I did. Uh, but so he's a, this is a list from a, a, like an American College of Cardiology uh, article, which basically just outlined the EP ablation procedure. So these are their seven big things to watch out for. So um, the, the first one is like what Melanie said, injury to viscera. And so, right, making sure you're, this is under floor, but making sure you don't go through the large bowel or another organ, right, that would be catastrophic. The reason that cardiology maps it in the lab is because you don't want to hit one of those epicardial vessels um, that's coursing through the, the pericardium. There's that right ventricular and LV puncture or tear, again, fairly catastrophic. And then we start getting into the ones that are actually important for us to know, which is what Paul brought up. So the big one here is going to be um, acute, acute post-procedure uh, and chronic pericarditis. And then pericardial effusion, like Melanie brought up tamponade, and then drain-related chest pain. This guy did not get a drain, so we can rule that one out. But these are going to be the three big ones that if we're admitting people at the VA or at the U after uh, VA, um, VT ablations that we should be on the lookout for, because these are three things that we should probably be able to diagnose ourselves, and you know we can actually do something about them as opposed to you know, a ruptured LV. Okay, so um, with that, how do we actually diagnose pericarditis? So if we were going to look out for this, how do we diagnose it? Connor, say it again. Clinically. Clinically, great. And what is your clinical diagnosis? Uh, you know, the typical pain, and certainly in this guy's case, like a predisposing factor. Great. So chest pain plus a predisposing factor. That's actually basically it. Um, so you do not need a uh, EKG to diagnose pericarditis. Pericarditis is not an EKG diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis uh, if they have sort of suggestive symptoms and that predisposing factor. Uh, and this gentleman's predisposing factor obviously is his VT ablation. So um, the resident who is admitting him post-procedure listens to his heart and hears that he has a friction rub. Um, so he is actually diagnosed with acute post-procedure pericarditis. Um, EP comes down and agrees and says, we should start initiating treatment for this guy. So uh, pericarditis treatment, what do we do? We'll start with an intern over at the farthest table. Colchicine, great, um, perfect. So number one is gonna be colchicine. What's another option? We'll say second years now, which is just Carl. <laughs> and said that they're like one of the one out of two thousand people that can get it. Yeah, great. So Carl brings up the even more important thing with NSAIDs is like the one out of a thousand that can actually tolerate it. Carl, who uh, who can actually who would you not give an NSAID to? Yeah, great. So heart failure, GI bleed, any history of ulcers, um, very few people can tolerate, but NSAIDs are actually the first line and a great drug for pericarditis. And then what's our last sort of treatment here? Steroids, great. So um, colchicine, NSAIDs, and steroids are the treatments for pericarditis, and that actually doesn't change post-procedure. Um, interestingly enough, though, there is, as I found out this morning, a fair amount of data on post-EP ablation pericarditis and what works and doesn't work. So they did a bunch of studies and they basically found that um, colchicine post-procedure is great. And so uh, this gentleman was put on 0.3 to 0.6 colchicine post-procedure. And the reason they do that is there's actually some RCTs and smaller studies showing that these people have better long-term outcomes than people on NSAIDs or people on steroids. Um, so colchicine is a great drug post-procedure. The other interesting thing they found is for steroids, you can give uh, basically intrapericardial uh, triamcinolone. And so again, these people uh, in some like very small RCTs, they did better with intrapericardial triamcinolone than with PO or like an IV steroid. Um, 
And the fun thing about this is that intrapericardial triamcinolone appears to decrease the risk of long-term kind of chronic pericarditis, which is the reason we avoid steroids in the first place. So, Yeah, good question. So yeah, so before they took out the catheter, they injected triamcinolone. So this guy got colchicine and he also got intrapericardial triamcinolone. Um, and so the reason that we don't give all clinic patients steroids for pericarditis is that if you do give someone steroids, you do increase their risk of chronic pericarditis. And so um, the intrapericardial triamcinolone appears to decrease that, uh, but still uh, there is still some risk. So colchicine, NSAIDs and steroids for um, pericarditis, Ideally, right, if we're in clinic or we're not dealing with the post-EP person, uh, one of these two things right here. Cool. So this guy gets his uh, EP ablation procedure. He's feeling good for about 24 hours. And does anyone want to take a guess what happens next? More VT. Carl, say it louder. More VT. More VT. Great. So this gentleman gets more VT. Uh, he gets more VT, and EP is consulted again, and EP says, let's put in a device. So EP puts in a device two days later because this gentleman is still having a recurrent VT. So um, for, I'll give you guys about 15, 20 seconds to take a look at this. And then again, uh, what I'll do is have an intern tell me uh, where this guy's leads are. So he has two leads, I'll give you that. Tell me where the leads are. Let's go try the interns here. Uh, Elizabeth, you're the last intern at that table, I think. Uh, where are this guy's two leads? So you're saying this one right here? Yeah. Okay. We got a guess for the LV. Yeah, no worries. That's, what, that's why we were talking about it, because we see a bunch of these x-rays, and it's good to know where these leads are. So um, the kind of confusing thing is that the devices are all placed in the venous system, and so you will never see a device lead in the arterial system. And so uh, you'll never see a device lead in the LV proper. Um, they're all going to be places you can get to through you know, venous blood vessels. So um, this large lead down here is in your RV. So that's your, that's like the true defibrillator coil. And so if you're actually gonna shock someone, the vector to shock is between the box, the cassette and this coil. And so like, you know, you put a pad on the person's front and the person's back when you're doing CPR, that's the same vector you're working with here. The cassette is a little bit more anterior and the coil sort of on the bottom. So you're crossing the heart. The other vessel there, the other lead is right here. And that lead is sitting in the right atrium. And so this gentleman has a right atrial lead and RV lead. And interestingly enough, um, the RA lead was not indicated in this for sort of typical reasons, uh, but this gentleman was actually getting bradycardic on amio. And so because he was getting a little bit bradycardic on VT therapy, they put in an RA lead as well in case he needed to be paced. So this RA lead is gonna pace and this RV lead is going to shock. Any questions about this X-ray and sort of why this gentleman got his ICD? Yeah, great question, Evan. Yeah, so if he had had if he had not been dealing with bradycardia from his uh, amio infusion, uh, then he would have just gotten the RV lead for an ICD because that would have been a class one indication for failing EP uh, VT ablation and also failing meds. But because he was having that bradycardia, he gets the RA lead as well. Cool. Um, awesome. And I'll tell you guys right now, if, if this guy had had a uh, CRTD device, you would have been looking for that coronary sinus LV lead and it would have sort of wrapped around like that. Um, so there would have been like three little white dots at the end. But uh, the VA is a great place to look for um, device leads and sort of learn your devices because a lot of our vets will have these. All right. The good news is this guy, this guy gets a CRTD device. Sorry, not CRTD. He gets an AICD with an RA and RV lead, and that actually helps his VT. So he is discharged from the U. Um, 
back to the community. So just to, just to run through this so far, we've talked about uh, his presenting VT, he had heart failure, newly diagnosed, he gets meds, he gets an EP ablation, uh, he has uh, pericarditis following EP ablation and gets a CRTD device. So our next step is gonna be the VA. So we're back, we're back home. This gentleman uh, presents, he's 59, VT status post ablation and implanted AICD, which we just talked about, complicated by pericarditis. He has hef ref with the EF of 40, like we talked about, coming in with palpitations and shoulder, back, and chest pain. And all of this is occurring two weeks after his discharge. So um, we'll say 30 years. What are you guys thinking hearing this story two weeks after discharge? Like, why do you, what's running through your mind if you were going to try to diagnose this guy or like what you're going to ask him on his way to the, the ED to see him? Cool. So thinking, is this procedural complication or is this an infection of the device or something like more sinister? That's Great. So what Melanie said is, could he just be, could he just have a device and the device is working properly, but it just keeps shocking him, which means that, right, something in his heart is still arrhythmic. Great. That's a pretty good place to start. So this gentleman, uh, he rolls in, he has a monomorphic VT in the ED which actually breaks uh, without any sort of intervention. He gets loaded with metoprolol and he gets admitted to the floor for further workup and management with kind of medicine and EP all following. Yeah, good question. So he does come in uh, on amio. So he's on amio at this point, PO, and he's on colchicine at this point as well. So um, I don't think anyone besides Dr. Wainer who is the attending is in here. So we'll just kind of keep moving forward. Um, but big events in this guy's hospital course. So he's admitted and he actually doesn't have a lot of recurrent VT right off the bat, but what he does have is a new diagnosis of AFib. So uh, sort of like we talked about in Eric's m, &M yesterday, uh, he has AFib and he has started on the Bigotran for anticoagulation. So we get started on the Bigotran for anticoagulation and then on hospital day two, so we'll say H2, he has VT again. And so from our, our list of our meds earlier in this talk, right, we talked about uh, amyo, lidocaine, mexilatine. What medicine, um, if you guys could choose, would you put him on now? He's hemodynamically stable, but he just keeps going into VT. Okay, so we have vote for lidocaine, great. So lidocaine, if he had been hemodynamically unstable would have been the right choice, but because he's hemodynamically stable, he gets uh, mexilatine added. Mixilatine is a PO med, uh, mixilatine gets added. So he's on, at this point, mixilatine and amio. And right around this time, he also starts reporting that he's got pretty bad GERD symptoms and nausea. Uh, <laughs> Melanie, why'd you say ooh? I mean, that could be uh, amyl or like But all the problems are Nice. So Melanie, rightfully so, is like, ah, this is pretty concerning for being a cardiac equivalent. Um, just wondering, because this will end up becoming important, or obviously, right, or else I wouldn't have mentioned it. Would anyone, does anyone make a lot whenever someone on inpatient side reports GERD, right? Or is that one of those things where you're like, Perlman solution, GI cocktail, please don't call me again. Say a lot. It depends. It depends. <laughs> Issue yeah, I think that's great. And so the takeaway here is if someone has a cardiac issue, right, you should probably think a little bit more critically about GERD. And then by the end of this, we'll talk about one other situation where you should think a little bit more critically about GERD. But I mean, honestly, if I was told about this, um, the team rules out a current uh, MI or sort of new ischemic event. And this guy just has really bad GERD and nausea. And the complicating factor with all of this, unfortunately, is that mexilatine and colchicine, both are pretty known culprits for causing nausea, vomiting, and GERD. So um, this gentleman um, is basically on meds that he can't tolerate. So he's moved to the ICU for IV medications to kind of lower his heart rate, uh, work on his AFib, et cetera. 
All right. So the course kind of continues. He's hanging out in the ICU, kind of sitting there doing okay. And then obviously things get worse. So this gentleman gets this EKG in the ICU. And at the same time this EKG is drawn or sort of shortly around it, his creatinine goes from 1.4 to three and his lactate goes from two to six. He has chest pain. He sort of had respirophasic chest pain the entire time because he has known pericarditis, but his chest pain is definitely still present. So we'll say uh, take uh, another, we'll take 30 seconds for this one because it's a great EKG. And then uh, we're gonna have a intern give a focused read, but a, like, like a longer focused read is what we'll call it. All right, we're back. So interns in the room. Oh, Nick, I forgot that Nick Morgan was in the room. Nick, you want to take a shot at it? Yeah, speaking of beer, um, some irregular for sure. Uh, this is, I'm not saying P word about it. Um, so I'm sorry to miss the word. I'll call it an error. Awesome. Nick, that was great. That was actually phenomenal. So you said you didn't see P waves, which is absolutely correct. So this gentleman is paced. And so if you look down here at the bottom, you can see these little spikes. So he's atrial pace. So you are correct. You are not seeing P waves. Um, and then you also called ST elevations in V2, V3, V4, which are absolutely correct. I'll tell you that he also has those in V5, V6 as well. Um, Paul, future cardiologist, any additional thoughts? Uh, you see, uh, what is ABL, the lateral lead, you see that. And I think that he's also um, pre cordial lead. V5 and V6 are more common in terms of the ST elevations as well as just um, consistent with the lateral sort of ischemia and then you see um, changes that are sort of um, in the anterior lead as well. Three in ABF, so you have the two ABF versus one ABF with the compression. The thing that you're actually going for. Cool. So kind of widespread, so if I'm reading this correctly, if you guys widespread ST elevations, maybe some T-wave versions in 2, 3, and AVF. And then does anyone make anything of AVR? Right, AVR, the forgotten lead. We almost never look at it until a chief brings it up in conference and everyone stares at it for 20 seconds. It's like, oh my God. Does any intern know what sign we are looking at? in AVR. That's all right. So this, uh, do any third years know the sign we're looking at? With the clinical history, right, that this gentleman has known pericarditis. Yeah, great. So Paul said we're seeing PR elevation. So what you're seeing in, in uh, AVR is called the knuckle sign. And so if you take your knuckle and you hold it like this, that is right, your PR elevation, and then you get an ST depression afterwards. So you basically get a PR elevation, and then it goes into this sort of ST depression like that. And that is pretty characteristic for pericarditis. And so all things considered, the EKG machine called this an acute STEMI, but the team kind of rightfully looked at this and said, widespread ST elevations, uh, ST depressions in AVR, this is consistent with pericarditis. And this is the first time this gentleman had actually had an EKG that looked like true pericarditis. So you guys are sitting in the room, he's got this creatinine that's rising, a lactate that's rising, an EKG that now looks like this and he's still symptomatic. His blood pressure is sort of 90 to 100 over 60s, which isn't too far off his baseline. What complications would you be concerned about, questions, et cetera? Can I ask a stupid question? No stupid questions. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, with pericarditis, I would expect like widespread ST changes, but like, wouldn't the like reciprocal changes here make you more concerned that he is having an MI or am I missing something? 
Yeah, good question. I I don't know if I have a great answer for that. Dr. Wender, do you have a great yeah. answer for that? I think it like definitely gives us pause to just do research like that. Yeah. Um, I think clinically, like the testing hadn't changed. It was like no like other sort of testing that you had a cat like two weeks earlier, right? Like, yeah. Two cats. It doesn't rule it out, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to me, I would like freak out. Yeah, right, right. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I, for the record, I haven't convinced Graham that this is not an MI. Uh, okay, so another way to ask what I just asked was, what are the complications of pericarditis? Like, what in the room should we be concerned about right now? Cool. So obstructive shock. Right, and what's what could obstructive shock be from in this guy? Great, so constrictive or... Tamponade, great. So right, tamponade, if you've got inflammation and you produce pus or something else there, you can get tamponade. So a throwback to a conference from last week when we talked about obstructive shock, but just because it's so important, we are gonna run through why obstructive shock causes uh, that pulses real quick, just because I think it's useful. If you heard this last week, I'm sorry, but right, this is uh, the heart again, right? So you've got your uh, pericardium around it. If this pericardium fills up with pus like this, when the heart expands, the LV and the RV, right? The RV can't expand into the pericardium because there's pus there or it's constricted. And so the septum then goes into the LV, right? The septum can only go one direction. It goes the path of least resistance, goes into the LV. When it goes into the LV, you decrease your LV volume, which means you then subsequently, right, decrease your cardiac output. And so if you've got uh, pus or constriction, septum goes into the LV, you decrease your um, cardiac output. Uh, and you drop your blood pressure. Same thing happens, right? If you take a deep breath in, you inhale, you increase your venous return. When you increase your venous return and the RV has to get larger, that septum goes over there again. So that's why you take those deep breaths in on pulses, you're getting a drop in your blood pressure because you're causing your septum to bow into the LV. So that's why people get uh, pulses paradoxus or the A-line variations. Any questions about that? That's a, a throwback to uh, last Monday, I think. Did you? Do you get a pulsus with constrictive pericarditis? I mean, I think that kind of forces too fast. But... Yeah, good question. So you do get a you do get a pulsus with constrictive. Realistically, I've never seen someone have acute constrictive pericarditis, uh, like you said. But theoretically, you would still get it because the physiology is the same. If the if the RV free wall can't go anywhere, uh, then the septum has to go somewhere. All right. So this gentleman. Concern for tamponade, bedside echo does show that he has an enlarging pericardial effusion and he is transferred emergently to the U for a pericardiosynthesis. So we'll zoom back out. We're now gonna finish with this whole a diagnosis is made. And so at this point, this gentleman has cardiac tamponade about four weeks after, three weeks after a VT ablation. Does anyone have a guess what's going on with this guy? Dressler. Dresslers, okay, Carl puts in a vote for dresslers, great. Infection, infection. Sanchez infection. You'll never guess it. Yeah, it's a complete zebra, which is why it's great. Cool. It is a complete zebra. Say it again. Yes. So Cassandra says this is a post procedural complication, which it will end up being that because we uh, are talking about post procedure stuff. So uh, this guy goes to the U, he has the echo and he gets a pericardiosynthesis and they drain out about um, 250, 300 cc's of purulent fluid. And this is his post-procedure chest X-ray. Um, we're, I'm just gonna point out on this X-ray here. Does anyone notice anything weird around his heart? <laughs> yeah, so that is, that is air in the pericardial space. Um, notably, this was not there before he had the intervention. So this is air from the intervention, but if he did have some sort of gas forming organism in the pericardial space, you could presumably see the same thing. So just be aware that that line is not physiologic or normal. Pericardium yeah, exactly. His pericardium is thick. So he's got a thickened pericardium and then he also has uh, air there as well. So at this point, you know, I would be pretty, sh pretty stumped at this point as to figuring out what's going on with this guy, which is why we have consultants in the world. And CT surgery is consulted, and CT surgery asks for a barium esophagram to evaluate for a fistulous connection between his esophagus and his pericardial space. They had to explore it when they did the culture too, so that was also as well. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a very good point, Dr. Wender. Yeah, so the reason they were concerned about that was he had pus 
250 cc's of pus in the space and mixed flora. All right, so um, this is, uh, we're gonna play this on loop here. This, this is a sophogram from the U. And great, so we're all, we're all amateur radiologists now, which is great. So you guys were looking for like the thing that didn't fit. And that thing right there, if we play it again, right? I hope none of our esophagus, esophagi, take a uh, hard turn like that. Esophagal, I'm not sure what the, the plural is, but so what this is showing is a esophag esophageal leak. So this gentleman has an esophageal leak into the pericardial space and they actually could only see it on this one specific view, um, but not great. So he then gets a CT chest. Here's his CT chest with oral contrast. And this is not an image, these are just isolated images because again, uh, this requires a radiologist to read, but take a look right here. That brightness is contrast, which is extravasated into his pericardium. And this right here is his esophagus. So his esophagus is kind of just running counter to uh, contrast in the um, pericardium. And then if you look on this lateral image here, that's that same contrast and that's the actual esophagus. So he has layering contrast in his pericardial space, which was enough for the radiologist to say this gentleman has a uh, pericardial esophageal fistula and needs CT surgery. So he actually undergoes CT surgery uh, two days later and they find a quarter size defect in his uh, esophagus connecting his um, uh, esophagus and his pericardial space. And then his final cytology, uh, negative for malignant cells, clearly, but he has abundant bacterial rods and cocci and a background of acute inflammation and proteinaceous debris. And then like Dr. Weiner mentioned, he has this kind of culture data grow out. He has a strep anginosis, uh, pericardial abscess, and um, something called uh, Gemella morbillorum. I don't know how I said that, but uh, he's got a, a basically a polymicrobial pericardial abscess from a fistulous connection with his esophagus. So this is a, so I'd say now the teaching points here, if your person just had a VT ablation and they have new GERD, think about that a little bit more critically, maybe along the lines of how we think about GERD and people who have known cardiac disease. Um, but more importantly, just understanding like what complications of VT ablations actually are. And so um, notably on here, you'll see that there is not a pericardial cardiac, uh, pericardial esophageal fistula, because that's pretty, pretty rare, like really, really rare. Uh, but just be aware that uh, it's a rare complication. And the reason this gentleman was predisposed to it per CT surgery is that he probably had chronic or uh, acute on chronic pericarditis, which caused inflammation, um, which eventually created this fistulous connection. So, so, it's not, so it wasn't the needle that's not a direct complication during the procedure. It's like the inflammation afterwards. Yeah, because the needle goes in anterior. And so there's no, it wasn't a needle injury. It was, a, it was an inflammation and... Um, the kind of like post-procedure inflammational injury. So the one thing I was gonna to say too, so when they do the ablation, is it on the inferior aspect of the ventricle or is it like? Um, yeah, the needle, the needle goes in anterior and then yeah. the catheter is sort of, the catheter they insert sort of snakes regardless yeah. of where it goes. But the, they, in the procedure report, they're a little bit more on the inferior side when they go in, but they're not all the way where the esophagus is. So the one thing I was gonna say, so just like as a kind of a, also like tidbit for another, really common cardiac procedures so afib ablation. I had a friend whose dad passed away. He actually had an afib ablation and he actually ended up getting a atrial esophageal fistula uh, because if you think about it, when they inject the, uh, I mean, they're literally like, you know, cauterizing or like destroying that myocardial tissue. And I think actually they cauterize it with heat because they actually put like a, a temperature gauge in your esophagus to like monitor that. And so like somebody coming in, if somebody gets atrial ablation, uh, a uh, atrial uh, atrial ablation, and they actually get um, like uh, they have like stroke like symptoms or anything. That's totally what they need because obviously that's like classic. It's going to be like air bullets and stuff like that. So just another thing to think about with common procedures, complications that are really rare. Yeah, uh, and then Corey's point: the temperature monitoring in the esophagus. They did not do that during this procedure because it sounds like during VT ablations, because they're not actually working in the atrium, that they're the data didn't necessarily support it. Um, so sort of even a weirder complication because they weren't even, it's even in that anatomic area. Any additional questions about this case? So uh, we, do, we see a lot of ET ablations. Thankfully, they don't go like this, uh, but a good case of cardiac tamponade and 
post-procedure complications. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. I uh, appreciate everyone coming. Uh, any additional questions, let us know. And in, uh, this was submitted by one of the teams, Dr. Wainer's team. So if you have any cool cases, please walk by our office.